he was a volcanically dynamic powerhouse soul singer. He hit the high notes with his deep voice in a manner that many artists just didn't have the vocal and lung power to do so. Injecting the emotions to the lyrics using vibrato, his unique style, which deeply resonates with the fans, was perfect for the Great Temptations group at that time. At a time when Motown was transitioning from the love ballads of Smokey Robinson to the then popular psychedelic soul of Norman Whitfield, heavily influenced by the likes of the legendary Sly Stone, his move to the Temptations was perfect. It is like it was written in the stars. For those who remember, when David Ruffin left the Temptations, we were quite sure no one was going to fill his shoes. But boom! In stepped a youthful Dennis Edwards, the perfect addition to the all-star lineup. Over to his personality, he was special in his own ways. A kind, down-to-earth and sweet, compassive soul, you could easily tell he had that Christian upbringing. He was also so polished and such a great, well-versed speaker who, when he spoke, he did it from the heart, exuding charisma everywhere he went. You have to stay close to the people, you know? Yeah. Keep your smile. And always be a person that the, the fans can talk to. He was also a tall drink of water and got many ladies confused many female fans and stars, Aretha Franklin being one of those who were carried away by his charm. But as they say, with such a special gift comes great responsibility. Endless trials and tribulations will be thrown your way, and that if you lack discipline you'll have to endure never-ending suffering, living in a life full of pain and regrets. Dennis Edwards, just like other musical stars in that era, experienced this in full effect with his association with David Ruffin and Eddie Kendricks, people he looked up to, heavily serving as influence. They might have referenced Dennis when they said, show me your friends, I tell you who you are. His star would quickly dim when he became hooked to drugs and fame got in his head, causing conflicts in a group which brought him to the top. His death too, in 2018, through mysterious circumstances allegedly involving his wife, summed up his frustrating final days. And as we try to dig deep into his puzzling death to find answers, let's go back in time to the genesis of his story, examining and scrutinizing his journey, leaving no stone unturned in our quest to put to end the infinite question marks surrounding his death. Dennis Edwards Jr. was born on February 3, 1943, in Fairfield, Alabama, about eight miles from Birmingham, to Reverend Dennis Edwards Sr. and Idessa Fuller. His passion in music was not by mere coincidence, he began singing in his father's church as early as age two. The church's piano used to be kept at their place, which prompted his interest to learn the instrument. In around between seven and ten years, his family moved to Detroit, Michigan, where he would continue singing in his father's church, eventually becoming a choir director. In his teenage years, he went to the Detroit Conservatory of Music, where he studied strings, harmony, and saxophone. He would go on to attend Cass Technical High School, but eventually graduated from Eastern High School. During the period he was in high school, it was a norm to be a member of gospel quartets. And this is where his interest in music went a notch higher. He began singing in a spiritual group from his father's church called the Crowns of Joy, where they used to sing at the church on Sundays. He would then move on to join the Golden Wonders, a gospel group that served as a step up for him into the religious field of music. It is also here that he began to get noticed by some of the famous rock artists. However, during his tenure with the two gospel groups, he never recorded with them. His gospel career was cut short after he was enlisted in the military, where from January 1961 to December 1965, he served as a field artilleryman in the US Army, spending most of his enlistment stationed in Europe, mostly Germany. His last major duty assignment was with Headquarters Battery, 2nd Howitzer Battalion, 35th Artillery, 7th Army. He became a specialist 4th class in the Army. It is during his stint at the Army that something special happened, something that would change the trajectory of his love and passion in singing. Stationed in Dachau in Germany at that time, he used to guard a Holocaust crematorium that was being preserved for history's sake. And while going through the horrors that came with the war, they had a number of ways to keep them distracted temporarily during their free time. One of them was by listening to music sent to them from their people back home. Edwards had a roommate by the name Jeffrey, whose father John surprisingly worked for Berry Gordy back in Motown. The dad would send over the latest tracks from the label to his son time in time. From Marvin Gaye, Mary Wells, 
The Temptations, The Four Tops, To Smokey Robinson and The Miracles, there was no record they didn't receive. And while listening to them, one record in particular caught Edwards's ears. The song My Girl by The Temptations with De said that Ruffin's voice gave him the itch. It became his favourite and always sang it day in, day out. He pushed this obsession to their mess hall where they had the army's piano and operator. And before you know it, he had formed a band. Going to nightclubs was another way that kept them distracted. They would attend nearby clubs, have a drink and also do catch-ups. One club in particular by the name The Birdland was where Edwards frequented. With the club always playing the old rock and roll and some German songs, he approached the owner of the club and requested if they would be allowed to perform at the club. He was given the green light and didn't fail to impress. In fact, he says that he used to earn more while performing off-duty than what he was earning in the military. This fueled his ambition to have a career out of soul music even further. To add on this, it is also while in service that he realized that his mentor Sam Cooke had switched from gospel to secular, and that's all he needed to be convinced. Heading back home, he was ambitious but had one problem, his parents. See, he was brought up in a religious home so he knew his parents wouldn't be okay with it. Regardless, this didn't stop him to pursue this path. He formed a small group, naming it Dennis and the Firebirds, performing all the Motown hits just like back in Germany, in local red light parties in the basement, being paid as low as $5 before ultimately being recruited at a famous club called the Mall's Bar on Joy Road, where he rose to the point of being paid as high as $1,000 per week. As predicted, his parents, however, stood their ground on their faith to a point that they wouldn't accept any money he gave them, as according to them, he sang the devil's music. Back at Maul's Bar, it was such a vibe, it drew a whole lot of nice girls, had a bigger dancing area, and there were no fights. With this, many big people frequented the place among them, Motown stars, which is how he got to know of them on a personal level. One of them in particular was the legendary bass player James Jameson. Jameson saw a potential in him, and told him he would have even be bigger artist if he chose to record his own music. Jameson even went ahead and arranged an audition for him at Motown, where they were impressed, but unfortunately didn't have a roster room for him at the time. The label, however, decided to pay him a retainer of $500 a week, which he gladly agreed to it. He continued working on his vocals, picking his check every week, doing nothing. With time, he started growing a little bit frustrated as he noticed that he actually sang better than most of the artists there. Songwriting and production trio Holland Dozier Holland had just left Motown in a round at that time over profit-sharing and royalties dispute with Berry Gordy and had formed their own record label. The trio, knowing he was idle, approached him to be their artist and even told him they were ready to buy him out of Motown. An excited Edwards went over to Motown to ask how much it would have taken for him to terminate his contract with them. Apparently, another opportunity had just presented itself for him at Motown, which he was about to know of. A member of the Contours had fallen ill and was at the hospital, and Motown needed someone to replace him as soon as possible, as in seven days. The group was scheduled to perform at the Howard Theater. That position was presented to him. On top of this, he was told that they were to open for The Temptations. Fast forward, he impressed that day to the point of Temptations members David Ruffin and Eddie Kendricks noticing him. And uh, that's that's when I really got the itch. I met Eddie and I, David, and I seen him. I seen him looking at me in the wings. I said, "Is that good or bad?" <laughs> right. They would become close friends thereafter. Following this perfect start, his career with the Contours looked even more promising when he played on lead vocals in "It's So Hard Being a Loser," issued in March 1967 a song that rose to number 35 on the R&B chart and number 83 on the pop charts. The group also continued performing their earlier hits like Do You Love Me, which increased their popularity. However, the group had one problem that limited them from reaching their full potential, drugs. It is what made most of the earlier members get kicked out of the group, and a young Edwards came to know of this one evening after one of their successful performances on the road. The group sought to doing the hard drugs as a form of celebration. As a result of this, the authorities arrested all of them the following morning, including an innocent Dennis Edwards, who would be taken to court and thereafter released on bond. Edwards was frustrated by this and decided to quit, requesting to be put back on retainer as he went back to performing at the club just like old times. 
And as he continued with this on one hand, the temptations were going through a crisis on the other hand. His friend David Ruffin wanted the group to be renamed to David Ruffin and the Temptations, something that didn't sit well with the other members. They didn't fancy the idea of one member being considered superior than the rest. With the wrangles persisting, they had no choice but to fire him. For his replacement, the group settled on Dennis Edwards. This news had Dennis Edwards in mixed reactions. He was shocked and hurt at the same time as he saw the group as a well-oiled machine and complemented each other perfectly. However, he was also happy that he had the opportunity to become a part of the group's legacy, something that he never imagined in a thousand years. Word about David Ruffin leaving didn't go down well among the fans, with many spelling doom for the group, as they believed that Ruffin was irreplaceable. And so, when Edwards was announced, they were curious to see how he'd perform in the quest to fill Ruffin's shoes. Edwards, with all his honesty, admitted he wasn't going to replace him, but he was going to give his utmost best. The Temptations officially introduced him on July 9, 1968, on stage in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. However, Ruffin, who was attempting to make his way back into the group, crashed the stage and took the mic off him, stealing the show much to the applause of the audience. Ruffin continued similar stunts for about a month, until the group decided to lay off Edwards, with the promise of a solo deal from Motown, and rehire Ruffin. When Ruffin failed to show for his return engagement in Gathersburg, Maryland the next night, Edwards was permanently kept on, and the Temptations refused to entertain rehiring Ruffin any further. Returning back to the group, he had difficulties like missing some words and dancing routines. However, the clean-hearted Paul Williams took him under his wings and showed him all the choreography, as well as stage professionalism. From then, Edwards always regarded him as a big brother and mentor, and never missed the chance to highly speak of him with respect, admiration, and love. I just want to thank him for showing me my way when he was in the group. He gave me all, all the inspiration I needed. His return also coincided with the change of the group's musical direction from Smokey Robinson's Love Ballads to The Psychedelic Soul by Norman Whitfield, greatly influenced by the emergence of Sly and the Family Stone with their Dance to the Music hit. They followed this approach recording Cloud Nine, in 1969. The title single charted at number six on the US pop chart and garnered the 1969 Grammy Award for Best Rhythm and Blues Group Performance, Vocal or Instrumental. Subsequent hit singles followed, including I Can't Get Next to You, 1969, Ball of Confusion, That's What the World Is Today, 1970, Superstar, Remember How You Got Where You Are, 1971, and Papa Was a Rolling Stone, 1972. Assumptions going round that Papa was a Rolling Stone was about his father are false, as his father died on the 3rd of October, and not the 3rd of September. At that time, the group was angered by the psychedelic style, and just wanted to go back to the ballads that made them famous. And that's the reason why Edwards, who was on lead vocals, sounded a little bit upset. Surprisingly, the single would go on to chart at number 5 on the R&B charts, and also won four 1972 Grammy Awards. Further creative disputes between Whitfield and The Temptations broke due to Whitfield's overemphasis on the musical composition over the vocals, prompting them to recruit Jeffrey Bowen as their producer. Bowen produced three albums for The Temptations, In a Mellow Mood, 1967, A Song for You, 1975, and Wings of Love, 1976. For Wings of Love, Bowen favored Edward's lead vocals at the group's expense. According to Williams, Bowen had never bothered recording the background vocals or mixed them audibly lower than Edwards' vocals. During the recording sessions, Bowen had taken Edwards aside, telling him that he didn't need to be with the other guys. He told him he would even make him a bigger star. This fame in Edwards had also led him to other trappings. Aretha Franklin had written her 1972 classic Daydreaming about the Temptations singer. The two fell in love and were close to marriage, but things came to a harsh end when Edwards began seeing Ruth Pointer of the Pointer Sisters. The two fell in love with each other due to their love for cocaine. Edwards and Pointer would briefly marry, but the two fell deep into cocaine addiction in the late 1970s. The drugs eventually played a role in Edwards' dismissal from The Temptations, but he rejoined the group when they returned to Motown in 1980. Drugs were a major part of Ruffin's notoriety, and it didn't help when Edwards began performing with ex-Temptations Ruffin and Eddie Kendricks, 
who reunited with The Temptations for the reunion album in 1982. The reunion eventually fell apart, as Ruffin's addictions made him unreliable, and soon Edwards began missing shows as well. He would be fired from The Temptations in 1984. He then pursued a solo stint, which saw him release a number of hits among them, the 1984 duet Don't Look Any Further with Sieda Garrett. This successful run saw him rejoin the group temporarily, only to leave again for a third and final time in 1987. Beginning in 1989, Edwards toured and recorded with Ruffin and Kendricks, billing themselves as the former leads of The Temptations. However, things would turn to the worst after David Ruffin allegedly died of an overdose at a Philadelphia crack house on June 1, 1991. Over a year later, in October 1992, Kendricks died from lung cancer in Birmingham, Alabama. Edwards would go on to form The Temptations Review featuring Dennis Edwards. The group included Paul Williams' son, Paul Williams Jr., and the rest is history. Away from the problems in his music career and drug addiction, his relationships too were greatly affected. Leaving Aretha for Ruth Pointer was just the beginning. The two had dated for one year in 1976 before marrying in 1977 and a year later divorced. They had a daughter, Isa Pointer, in 1978. While they were together, Ruth pointed out that Dennis's addiction became worse as days went by. She says Dennis was the only child back home and his mother had excessively spoiled him by pampering him too much. With this, he always put himself first and that he never liked to share. She says with time, Dennis's cocaine intake had worsened to a point that he had surpassed even more than Ruffin's intake. To her, she felt that she was taking care of another baby. So they divorced. And true to her words, his mother back home was really worried about him. During his addictions and other problems, she never ceased to pray for him and even decided to take matters into her own hands. Wanting Edwards to change his lifestyle, she moved to St. Louis when Edwards was living in Hollywood and told him to pay a visit there, tricking him into believing she was dying, a trick that saw Edwards permanently move to St. Louis to be with her. Years later, he declared that moving there was the best thing that happened to him. All through his days, he had his fair share of relationships but failed to sustain them till the 90s when he met Brenda Edwards. The two married in 2000 and lived together thereafter. However, his life from then was marked by a series of illnesses with him in and out of hospital. He had been battling meningitis, being in and out of hospital, and even though he would go on to succumb to the disease on February 1, 2018, just two days before his 75th birthday, the disturbing events of his final days proved to sum up the suffering he had undergone ever since he got hooked on drugs. Reports claimed that his wife had been abusing him in his last days. Court documents filed by an adult protective services investigator alleged that weeks before the singer's death, Brenda Edwards abused her husband. The documents alleged that Brenda had attempted to suffocate the 74-year-old by holding his head face down on a bed. The investigator also accused her of taking her husband's hearing aids from him, according to a petition for an order of protection. The documents say Edwards was bedbound and immobile. An emergency protective order against Brenda was granted January 18th, barring her from contact with Dennis Edwards. Rumors alleging that she wanted to fasten his husband's death to inherit his wealth were squashed by her, saying that she loved him and would never have done any harm on him. He left behind five daughters and a son. With his death, music fans lost yet another pillar of that legendary group. His voice is definitely part of the fabric of American music. He was soul personified. This man was nobody's footnote. He was more than a quote-unquote the other guy who stepped in to replace the legendary David Ruffin. It was his voice that carried the temptations through their most sonically ambitious period. And it was his approach that came to define the temptations vocally throughout the 1970s into the 80s. He may have had his weaknesses and a faults, but every time he stepped on stage, he ensured we got entertained. Till we meet again, brother.